on behalf of Zero Malta, I would like to welcome all of you to our webinar on the demand for human trafficking. We will focus on sexual slavery and forced labor and how we can curb the demand for these forms of trafficking. In order to end human trafficking, it is essential that we target demand rather than focusing purely on supply side measures. While the status quo is to employ supply side measures, these measures can only be reactive. Whereas demand side measures are proactive in the prevention of human trafficking, as demand is a root cause of trafficking and therefore must be pursued in the fight to end this affront to human rights and human dignity. There are today more people in slavery than in, at any time in human history. Sexual slavery, including forced prostitution and the sexual exploitation of children, is the most prominent form of human trafficking, according to UNODC. The commodification of the human body, especially of women and children, transforms the victims of sexual slavery into objects that can be bought and sold, bartered and stolen. On another way, we are all consumers of forced labor. As such, we have to take the responsibility for the products we purchase. Uh, human trafficking is present in practically every supply chain. And therefore, we are all participants in the demand for forced labor. Because of the opacity of supply chains, it is difficult to detect the extent of forced labor in the production of the goods and services we consume. In a culture of consumerism, uh, we are constantly looking for cheaper products. We need to realize that we are part of the problem and therefore we must be mindful of the products we consume. Tonight, we are very fortunate to welcome three distinguished speakers. First, Inge Bell, a German human rights activist, entrepreneur and chairperson of the women's rights organization Terre des Femmes and the Bavarian branch of the aid organization Solbody. She is an advocate for the reform of prostitution laws in Germany, a move towards the Nordic model, which focuses on demand by penalizing the bias of sexual slavery. Second, Brian Isling, founder of the Geneva-based Slave Free Trade, a non-profit fighting against slave labor. Brian is also a specialist in demand-side responses, as demand is a driving force for all forms of human trafficking. He's a former Australian soldier and federal agent with 30 years of experience in the fight against human trafficking. Our third speaker will be Valiant Ritchie, an OSCE special representative and coordinator for combating trafficking in human beings. He represents the OSCE at the political level on anti-trafficking issues and assist the 57 OSCE participating states in the development and implementation of anti-trafficking strategies and initiatives. Before joining the OSCE, Valiant worked for 13 years as a prosecutor in Seattle handling sexual assault, child exploitation and human trafficking cases. And now I have the great pleasure uh, to uh, give the floor uh, uh, to our first speaker, and uh, may I ask uh, Brian Islin uh, uh, to start? Uh, and uh, and I uh, know also Brian, you are a specialist. You also you 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 gave us this idea to switch from supply side to demand. So uh, uh, it's uh, it's very good that you you start this webinar, please. Thank you. First is always the tricky one, right? A lot of pressure. But thanks, Michelle. It's a great pleasure as always to be here to talk, in particular to talk about the demand side and to sit in the company of uh, Inge and uh, Valiant. So I, I wanted to start just by spending a little time on what I describe as exploitation creep. And then I'll help turn your thoughts to what the demand side is 
some possible demand side solutions, in particular for human rights issues in workplaces and global value chains. I'm going to focus on the labour side of the question. So over the last 20 or so years, the problem of human trafficking has become a, as everybody knows, a focus of government and advocacy agendas worldwide. And it has become a subject of enormous amounts of funding over the years as well. Increasingly, we talk about human trafficking of all types as modern day slavery or modern slavery. And the phenomenon itself has prompted the rapid proliferation, let's say, of international, regional, anti-trafficking laws, agencies and, uh, and policies. And it's inspired states to devote enormous financial and bureaucratic resources to its eradication. There's barely a government in the world now that doesn't have a unit that deals with this issue. When I started talking about human trafficking back in 2000, in, uh, 2000 at the time of the protocol, no government agency had trafficking people. So it's all spawned an industry of non-profits as well that have ele elevated the, the abolition of trafficking into a rather pressing moral campaign. Uh, and anyone can join in these campaigns, right? There are the grassroots campaigns. Almost every country has these anti-trafficking organizations. You can join them basically at the click of a mouse. Uh, and of course, legal scholars have jumped into the fray because ever since the trafficking protocol, there's, a, there's been debate in particular about how law can be marshaled and which laws, you know, the trafficking protocol comes from the Human Office on Drugs and Crime. It doesn't come from the human rights bodies. So then which laws apply? Human rights law, trade law, labor law, uh, and if you look at the United States, even military might has been brought in to combat trafficking. But what exactly is it everyone is trying to fight? I think there's still phenomenal differences and, 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 and arguments, clawing arguments people clawing each other's eyes out about the definitions. So, and I think notwithstanding the global consensus that trafficking is some, something to be rid of, the anti-trafficking field is actually, even after 20 years since the pro, 22 years since the protocol, it's a strikingly rigor free zone. It's a thinking free zone when it comes to defining the concept, measuring its extent and arriving at solutions. And Against a rigor-free background, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that we fund the programs the way we do in, our, in, a, in a very blinkered way, and I'll, and I'll go through that right now. So during the first decade of the modern anti-trafficking regime, finding its roots in the trafficking protocol, the US was a mover and shaker and used its influence to pressure other states to establish aggressive, perpetrator-focused criminal justice responses to trafficking. That's where the protocol started. That's why it came from the UNODC and not the Human Rights Council. Dramatic changes in the anti-trafficking field since the year 2000 have led to a second generation of battles over definitions and approaches. There were very, there were wild battles between different parties in the drafting to the protocol. And we have new battles now. Uh, prompted, I think in many parts by works of the, by the efforts of the Obama administration to promote a broader legal definition and a broader policy understanding of trafficking, which I'm in favor of, uh, at the same time, it drew the crabs, right? There was really some discontent amongst a lot of people for this broadening of the definition. Um, and there's been a lot of, let's say, I would say it called a discursive conflation, uh, the aggregate effect of which is different and usually well-intentioned initiatives coming together, butting heads with each other, and has resulted in what I refer to as exploitation creep. So over time, all forced labor and increasingly all exploitative labor has been recast as trafficking, even if no one changes location at all, because you remember the original definition of trafficking in the protocol required a movement. Second, all trafficking is now widely being labeled as slavery. Exploitation creep has been expressed through efforts to expand previously rather narrow legal categories, in fact, extremely narrow legal categories, at least in terms of rhetoric and policy, but also sometimes in, with hard law, like the modern slavery acts that are trending around the world. In a, in a bid to subject a broader range of practices to a greater amount of public opprobrium. And I'm all for it. I think that there are, you know, all of the things that we now call modern slavery are absolutely valid in, in our, in, they're absolutely valid for inclusion in us uh, uh, responding to that and protecting people. 
This effort has involved, for example, breaking out of the earlier legal limitations brought about by the Trotter Protocol, including the elements of movement, situations in which people are maintained or born into forced labor are included, and the legal and moral category of slavery, the prohibition of which has existed, as you know, in international law far longer than trafficking, which was and was previously reserved for the most extreme forms of exploitation, but has now been extended to cover all trafficked persons. So after almost two years of this exploitation creep, we've unintentionally infused a labor perspective into trafficking law and policy regime. So you see where I'm going with this and why I'm talking about this as a prelude to talking about the forced labor. So by that, I mean, the ex ex by expanding the reach of anti-trafficking regimes to include forced labor, and now even in the last perhaps six years, other substandard labor conditions, exploitation creep has also made labor policy and the concept of labor itself explicitly relevant to a field that hitherto and through the protocol was narrowly focused actually on sexual exploitation. So from this labor perspective, trafficking needs to be understood as a product of weak labor and actually quite dreadful migration frameworks. A rising chorus of labor institutions and advocates is consequently, and, and mostly over the last 10 years, seeking strengthened labor protections as a means of reducing vulnerability to trafficking. So exploitation creep has helped bring the anti-trafficking community, such as it is, it's a very broken community, to a crossroads. And frankly, it's a crossroads at which we've now been stuck for the better part of these last two years. Uh, sorry, the last 10 years. That junction is, do we stay the course of criminal justice-focused policy like the overwhelming number of states want, or do we also pursue the structural changes that a labor approach prescribes? And the labor approach is mostly driven by NGOs and international organizations, not by states. So I would argue for the latter option, that we need to pursue the structural changes that a labor approach prescribes. Since the modern anti-trafficking regime's inception, and I've said this a dozen times in, in, in these webinars with you, Michelle, crime control focused interventions have produced at best disappointing results. Even if you look at some of the better, but still hugely flawed, flawed metrics that are out there. Arguably one of the strongest regimes on anti-trafficking, the United States, sees only tens of thousands of victims. And globally, if you think about the, 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 the backdrop to this, tens of thousands are a teardrop compared to the dozens of millions that another equally flawed, flawed source, the Modern Slavery Index suggests we have out there. I think that I've said this many times, but I think we need to look at numbers around this with an incredibly big grain of salt. Um, and what we should consider is just we're talking tens of millions, or in fact, if you hundreds of millions of people in conditions that are unacceptable, including child labor. So because the trafficking protocol was neg negotiated under the purview of the UNODC, the drafters were law enforcement officials, they're un unversed in human rights standards, and they were only interested in human rights standards insofar as they serve crime control goals. So I think we got exactly what we asked for, but it wasn't where it, 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 it was so limited in scope. Exploitation creep was almost always going to happen, and it has. I think it's fair to say that the human rights advocates in the drafting of the protocol were pretty well caught flat-footed by the, the extensive focus on a crime control frame, let's say. So border control and crime control were the, were the leading, leading points, and human rights advocates were pretty much sidelined in many ways. So. Even against the backdrop of the exploitation creep, though, a slow move away from older forms of trafficking to these broader definitions, there's still something missing in our response. So while labor exploitation has been added to the agenda, the old criminal justice model prevails. So as a metaphor, while the menu has changed quite dramatically, the way we're eating it remains the same. What is missing are demand side interventions entirely missing. So, and to understand the demand side and why we should be working on the, on the demand side, you need to first under understand the, the, the causation when we're talking about labor exploitation and, and human trafficking, modern slavery generally. For decades, it has suited many NGOs and governments and international organizations largely for funding purposes to stay on this criminal justice path because states 
are upholding the criminal justice path and they're the principal funders in this field. You could, you could actually say that thousands of organisations worldwide have benefited from this narrow, this historically narrow range of eating options and none of them want to rock that financially viable meal ticket. So you can count easily on one hand the organisations that have been swimming against that tide, uh, easily less than one hand. So let's talk about the, what the problem is confronting us and, wh and where causation comes into it. And I want to start by saying that my definition of causation is the same as Friedrich Nietzsche's, which is that we're not looking when we're trying to find cause on the small force that propels a boat out into a river. We're looking, you have to go back beyond that to the source of the river. And this is where causation comes in. So the problem really confronting us is we, we need to distinguish cause from vulnerability. And this is something that has taken 21 years and still doesn't happen. I still see trafficking, counter-trafficking people writing articles talking about po poverty as a cause of trafficking. The causes of all forms of exploitation is the instigating existing demand for people to be exploited. We often hear these, there was this phrase in the, two, in the early 2000s, the three Ds, dirty, dangerous and degrading work. So with Exploitation Creek, we've actually gone beyond that to any labour that is exploitative. It's beyond dirty, dangerous and degrading. So what is not a cause of modern slavery is a vulnerability to be enslaved. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a logical fallacy that we believe that. It's not sexual abuse that causes modern slavery. It's not poverty. It's not unemployment, undocumented or documented migration, not inadequate laws or bad policy. These are not causes of modern slavery. The problem confronting us is someone who makes the moral and economic choice to exploit somebody else. And that right there is the essence of demand. Because if we're addressing vulnerabilities, we're arguably on what's called the supply side. If we're addressing cause, we're on the demand side. Someone makes the premeditated or an opportunistic decision to exploit someone else's labor and in so doing denies them decent working conditions. And the person behind this decision is what we're looking at in addressing the demand side. I mentioned before that there's a, you know, most of the organizations in the world, the vast overwhelming majority of organizations are writing a kind of a meal ticket. And more than 99% of global spending on modern slavery is spent on the supply side because of our universal criminal justice fixation. And I come from a criminal justice background, right? I'm used to being the knee jerk reaction. But criminal justice is a knee-jerk reaction to modern slavery. All of the modern, modern money for modern slavery is spent either rescuing victims during the exploitation or fixing the victim up after being exploited. No money goes into addressing the structural problems behind it all, which is the demand. And I want to put out here, and Michelle, please jump in if I'm going far too long, but a very useful analogy since we all know what COVID is. For COVID-19, there are effectively two possible responses, right? There's treatment which is, for example, the emergency room, and there's vaccination, which helps prevent the disease continuing in the pen and cuts the pandemic off. You can't solve the problem of COVID, a pandemic, through treatment. Important as it is to provide services to help people who are sick, it's not that you stop the emergency treatment, but you can't solve COVID that way. You are not, by, by treating everybody coming in, you are not making a dent in the structural problem. So you can't invest everything in emergency treatment rooms. And at the moment with trafficking, we're investing everything in emergency treatment rooms. To make a dent in the structural problem of a pandemic like COVID, we needed to vaccinate. It's a long and slow process compared to immediate treatment. It demands an investment and it demands patients to see it work. It's not immediate. It doesn't give these quick wins that government agencies so much want and donors so much demand. And so it's precisely the case with modern slavery. We're spending 99% on treatment and treating cases as they emerge, which, as I say, is important. You can't ignore it uh, or finding cases in the community, but we're not preventing anything. We're not changing the system. We're not changing the dynamics of what are essentially markets for exploitable people. The treatment room is the supply side of the modern slavery problem, and, ar and it arises from the original criminal justice approach that we intended. But it's never been adjusted over time because of, largely because of funding myopia. It becomes a self-perpetuating spiral of, we fund what we ask for. Uh, so the demand side, which is the vaccination approach, is the only way to end modern slavery. And I want to be very clear. I've said this a few times, Michelle, as you probably remember. Anyone telling the world that they are ending or eliminating modern slavery 
but is working on the supply side, uh, they're deluded, right? They're uh, deluded at best, lying at worst. They are changing nothing on the macro level because the treatment room doesn't work on the macro level. It's a micro impact. So at its core, modern slavery is many markets for people who are, ex are exploitable by those who benefit from the exploitation to satisfy the demand for their labor. For exploiting others in their workplaces, the exploiter's why is simply that every single day they calculate that it doesn't hurt their business to do so and maybe even make a profit. They reason, although to be frank, not in such elaborate and clear terms, that there is no business disadvantage, sorry, there's no business advantage for them to treat people better. And so they do the minimum or even worse. Now remember, for a huge percentage of the world's population, and this is going to sound cynical, intrinsic good has nothing at all to do with business. Friedman told the world's private sector to make money at any cost, and so they do just that. And if you look at any bank, if you look at any financial institution, and you look at the vast majority of MBA programs around the world, it's still that to this day. And it remains the prevailing way business gets done. Just ask any of the big four management consultancies, as cynical as that sounds. So the central problem for anyone addressing modern slavery and a particular forced labor in global value chains is business people who don't find a place for intrinsic good in their business. And they abuse human rights or they allow the abuse or overlook the abuse in human rights of human rights in their global value chain because it doesn't hurt their business to do so. And in fact, even more cynically, it doesn't provide a return on investment. That behavior is directly driven by consumer demand. We ask, we're asking businesses to provide a burgeoning volume of goods and services through their global value chains. They continue to outsource and lose accountability in their chains. And that demand is enabled by all of us who consume. Without, without knowing the conditions under which they were made, we buy from those businesses and demand more from those businesses. We get what we asked for, in fact. We are getting what we've asked for. We've trusted the private sector to do the right thing. That trust was very, very badly misplaced. Indeed, I mean, if you think about it, it makes no sense that trust was provided to the business world, the private sector in the first place. So this is how I came to create Slave Free Trade. Michelle mentioned I run an, an, a global NGO. After years of working on this supply side, only to find, just like with counter narcotics and counter small arms, both of which I've done, only to find that those actions are futile. They have no impact whatsoever. So I thought we needed a systemic response to the systemic problem. We need to go to the root, the causes, the demand behind it. So the slavers and exploiters I've met over the years are not complete ratbags. Lots of them are just opportunistic and they're users of people. They're taught to use people. Their parents teach them to use people. The way we raise boys is a big part of it. And like so many of the world's population, that's how business is done. We can actually take a lot of them out of the business of slaving by giving them something more positive to strive for. Um, and some of you, again, will find this a little cynical view, but it can't, it cannot be about the intrinsic good. We are not going to win an argument with business asking them to respect the intrinsic good that comes with human rights in workplaces and global value chains. That doesn't appeal to them. I have had in writing from hundreds and hundreds of businesses that human rights are not on their agenda. It still needs to boil down to money. So what we need then is to build a better, healthier, more respectful market to be in. There needs to be value for the business in addressing modern slavery in their value chains. They're always asking, but what is the ROI? What will it cost? Clearly, we need to construct markets that businesses need to want to be part of for their own, let's say, selfish and commercial reasons, because that's where we're going to get people to change their behavior. So that would mean a completely new way of thinking about modern slavery. It means reconceptualizing human rights and workplaces and building a new economic model, even if that sounds idealistic, that advantages, advantages your business if you respect human rights. And that's the slave free trade model. So the central question was, how do we make respecting people pay? What would a market look like in which you can't participate if you're not up for doing good, if the intrinsic good does not become a part of your bottom line? So effectively, this takes turning market forces back on themselves to reinforce good behavior. That takes harnessing what everyone points out to be problematic, like the proliferation and multiplication that occurs in global value chains, turn it back to our advantage, make it, an, make it a, 
don't make it a disadvantage anymore. And, and clearly this is no small task, but you know, ending the pandemic wasn't a small task either. So, and, and I've said over the few, over the last few webinars that the numbers being thrown around, you can only come to the one inescapable conclusion about the real extent of this problem. Millions, hundreds of millions of people are being exploited or abused each day. This is a task, even if it's big, we need to be up for. And we need to explore solutions that operate at the system level. I could go on a little bit longer, Michelle, but it's completely up to you if you want, want me to, to, to stop here. There's a natural break in, in my cadence right now. If you're up, if you're up for that, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Back to uh, And uh, as you know, uh, you will have a, a chance to take the floor again, eh? because. Uh, yeah. uh, but still, as we have uh, now Ingebel with us, but uh, very, very happy to see you. And as you know, uh, uh, Valian Fritchie is also uh, uh, waiting to speak. But uh, uh, now I think I, I would like uh, uh, to hear Ingebel about. Uh, you, you you have a lot to say also a, a lot and uh, uh, and you you say it very well so very happy looking forward to listening to you thank you very much michelle and thank you also brian I, and um, i'm very happy that i can talk um, about the demand in germany and i brought also some voices from john's with me but first of all let me present um, myself as you know those who heard me before here in this um, panel together with you, uh, dear Michelle. They know me already, but let, uh, let's uh, talk also to the others who don't know me. Well, uh, I'm uh, the deputy chairwoman of Terre des Femmes. Terre des Femmes, Germany's largest, Germany's biggest women's rights organization since 1981. So Terre des Femmes exists since 1981. I'm uh, the deputy chairperson since um, 2017. And I'm also in uh, the uh, chairperson of the Bavarian branch of Solvodi, Solidarity with Women in Distress. Solvodi, Germany's largest um, humanitarian aid organization for helping women uh, who are victims of trafficking or female genital mutilation or sexual or domestic violence with 19 uh, consultation centers and seven shelters around Germany. Solvodi, as you may know, was founded by Sister Schwester Lea Ackermann in Africa in 1985. So um, the issue of human trafficking uh, was very uh, or became very actual during the Corona crisis. Uh, then it was it became very visible during the Corona crisis uh, that the women and girls in prostitution here in Germany in Germany prostitution is legalized that they are um, that that they have no flats to live in. The German law says they should have provided a room outside of the brothel or the club or so where they work in, but it became obvious that they don't have uh, flats outside that they would live in the in the brothels. Um, and this was, and they would starve. And so when Corona hit uh, in uh, in Germany, this was very visible. And now everyone started uh, asking, "Oh my God!" So prostitution is not a job like every other job. Uh, when the when the so-called sex workers are out in the streets, or they go back to Romania or Bulgaria, most of them are from southeastern Europe. I come back to the numbers later, and they go back to uh, or are sent back to um, uh, Romania or Bulgaria, and then they come back illegally again because they say, and this is our witness in Solvodi, for example, they say, better I'm here in Germany illegal, illegally than I starve in Romania. So. Uh, the second um, issue where uh, prostitution, that prostitution is not, not such a wonderful thing, became uh, obvious in the Ukraine war right now. Because uh, as you may have heard, and uh, the same is true in other uh, countries as well, where there are these migrants, um, the refugees from Ukraine, mostly women and children, there are the traffickers. Traffickers already waiting for them in the, in the um, uh, stations or in the bus terminals where they arrive in order to to hire them in order to lure them into prostitution or to offer them very um, notorious um, offers to stay with them so uh, the demand for Ukrainian girls and women in prostitution is is a huge one as the whole prostitution market in, in um, Germany is provided by mostly women from Eastern and Southeastern Europe, mainly Romanian, Bulgarian, Hungarian, and as well, Ukrainian women and 
very young women. In Germany, the prostitution market says that around between 200,000 and 1 million um, women and girls are in prostitution. Most of them are migrant women, 80 to 98 percent, it depends on, on the city, but 80 to 98 percent are migrant women, mostly from, as I said, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, and also Ukraine. Of course, we do have also uh, women from uh, Africa and Asia, and there um, we witnessed in the past years that the, the, the raising numbers of Niger Nigerian women in uh, trafficking. So Nigerian women, and you know this is very special because African women or Nigerian women are often bound by this juju um, ma magic uh, voodoo uh, thing, and they would never go to police and say something because they are bound by their faith, yeah, by their voodoo faith. So where does uh, prostitution take place in Germany? It's in legal brothels, it's in flats, and it's on the street. Prostitution is legalized since 2000, um, and this is very cynical, but prostitution in Germany is in, indeed considered as a job, a job as every other job since 2000, since the liberation or le uh, legislation of prostitution took place. So in Germany, prostitution is a job and the women in prostitution are like sex workers. In the same time, Sweden, as we all know, Sweden went a different uh, path and in Sweden, prostitution is violence against women, is considered violence against women. In 2000, they decided to go, the Swedish decided to go this other path, which is now well known as the so-called Nordic model. First of all, it was known as the Swedish model, but later on, Norway in 2008, Ireland, Iceland, Northern Ireland, Canada, uh, later on, France, Israel, um, joined this Nord, so -called, then so-called Nordic uh, model. And now we have the recent news since two weeks that also Spain is preparing a law uh, or um, yeah, preparing a law uh, according to the Nordic model. So, and what does the Nordic model mean? Let me just sum up and then I, I come to the demand side. The Nordic model means, first of all, it's, it has four columns. Yeah? So first of all, prostitution is violence against women and girls. So the Swedish um, legislation says uh, the, the law in Sweden um, is named uh, women's peace, Kvinnafrid, peace for women, women's peace. Yeah? So um, prostitution is, is uh, seen as violence against women and girls. And the Nordic model says that we want to provide real help and protection for the women in prostitution, which means women are decriminalized. Yeah? They are decriminalized in uh, women of prostitution, but the johns, the demand side is criminalized. So criminalizing the johns, the sex, the so-called sex buyers, this is uh, one of the columns of the Swedish model. And of course, um, in early age already, women, um, so boys and girls are made aware that prostitution is violence against women already in kindergartens and in schools. So this early awareness raising is part of the Nordic model and the conscience that girls and women are not for sale. So this is the Nordic model, which is in um, more than 10 or 11 countries already in, um, in, in force. And as I said, uh, Germany took the other path 20 years ago, but the Nordic model is heavily discussed now since I said lately, latest with the um, Corona crisis and also the Ukrainian war. But um, it is also discussed because we do have a lot of um, wonderful women um, former in formerly in prostitution and who are really, um, they are now ready to talk about their uh, experiences in prostitution and about the this um, this devil circle of uh, this vicious circle of um, coercion of misery of poverty of um, lack of perspective and of of course force and violence and this made the problem so visible um, which now fires or fuels the discussion here in Germany to um, finally come to also to the conclusion that the um, approach of legalizing prostitution has failed and that we need some other approach which could be the Nordic model. 
And what I what I brought to you now is um, this was a short wrap up about the situation um, of uh, in Germany. What I brought to you now is I brought some quotes. I brought some quotes, ten quotes, ten quotes by Johns. Because we do have in Germany a wonderful project made by a, um, a, also a human rights activist, a women's rights activist here in Germany, and it is called Die Unsichtbaren Männer, the Invisible Men, which means the Johns. And this, um, this uh, humanitarian, um, the human rights activist, she's collecting these, she's collecting quotes made by Johns in the internet forums, in the internet platforms, because as a result of legalizing prostitution, prostitution is a job like every other, we do have in Germany a lot of internet forums, internet platforms, so-called Johns forums, yeah, in, um, Freier Foren, in which the Johns, um, the sex buyers, um, I, I do not like the term sex buyer because it's, it's not sex. <laughs> Sex is, is pleasure, yeah? Sex should be pleasure. It's um, sexual, um, yeah, uh, satisfaction maybe, yeah? So you buy a sexual satisfaction or, uh, but it's um, it's just one side who has the sexual satisfaction, yeah? So, but um, it's so John's, John's forums and I brought 10 quotes and of course they don't express my, my point of view and we do also have a trigger warning here. Please be prepared. The next 10 slides I will show to you. Uh, contain sometimes a quite um, heavy language, an explicit language. So just 10 quotes from uh, from these invisible men who make you already clear what the situation of prostitution and human trafficking in Germany is and that the Johns are not, um, how can you say, they are not men who don't know about the uh, mechanism of organized crime, of coercion, of violence and force in that um, in that business, they know very well. So now let me check whether I can share here my screen. Um, screen, start sharing the screen. And now, Michelle, please give me feedback. If you already see this first slide, the screen slide, do you see that? Yes. Okay, so <laughs> a trigger warning as well, because here comes some explicit language, M maybe not in this first quotation. So 10, uh, 10 men who speak. So first of all, uh, just wanted to point out that the Eastern World EU expansion has brought many new women over to us. For us, Johns, this is a good thing. But for the affected countries, it's a tragedy. If I think about how many Romanian women are in the sex trade in Western Europe, and especially in Germany, it's got to be tens of thousands, if not the Lusthaus Forum, one of the famous um, German sex bias forums in 2014. Let's have a look at another quote. 2018, the AO Forum, AO Forum, this means alles ohne, this means everything without, so sex without condom. Yeah. Visited this girl yesterday on the fifth floor and she opened the door with a thick black eye. Must have accidentally run into a cabinet. Her friend worked behind the curtain in the same apartment. She was very service oriented, but you can clearly notice that this is not a job for her in the long run. In pain, she allowed the penetration and you could bend her legs and move them around. The expression on her face spoke volumes. She probably just didn't want to catch a second black eye. So you see the violence in this business. From uh, last month, 2022 in May, men need sex and we will find ways to get it. Sex work is the best compromise. For every country that adopts the Nordic model, there will be at least two that decriminalize work. From that, there are many ways to circumvent the Nordic model, like shaming men never backfires, like literally Elliot Roger, Alec Manessian, Jake Davison, and Anders Breivik, Stephen Paddock, debatable, uh, for example. And these are mass murders, by the way. 
Access to sexuality decreases aggression, so those incidents could have been avoided. Destigmatizing the sex industry would be the first step in the right direction. Or another quote, 2016. Of course, she's a victim of trafficking. What do you mean someone should inform the relevant authorities? Fucking her is pretty decent. Her figure is all right. Nobody needs to look at her face with broken teeth during the fucking. Close your eyes and put in your thing. Those who don't wish to fuck but, but would rather wait for the relevant authorities better be making their daily trips to church to get chastised or just go chastise yourselves. Or let's hear this uh, very recent quote from April. I would like to favor Ukrainian sex workers in Vienna at this point in time so that they can make enough money to send to support their lo loved ones at home or fleeing. I reckon I'm not the only one. Any suggestions? I should add that I prefer 18 to 25 year old girls and primarily seek girlfriend sex with cuddling and French kissing. I want something out of it too. And yes, I mean girls from Ukraine who have already worked as sex workers in the past and not current refugees. The beautiful Lana who is slightly older than my target group, but whom I have enjoyed twice, would technically not be included in this search. Age lives in Ukraine, but is from Russia. But for such an awesome kitten, I, of course, will make an exception. So you see the demand side demands very young women or girls. From 2020. The EU expanding as well as the German prostitution law of 2002 have created a humanitarian catastrophe. In many places, there's no longer any diversity of horse, no Poles, Czechs, dark-skinned ones, Asians. There are only Romanians and Moss and Bulgarians. In Romania, there definitely are brutal gangs of pimps. The breaking in process is not a myth. Truly free and independent women are extremely rare. Bulgarian gypsy clans send their sister into street prostitution and the sheer brutality that she lives under inside her family cannot be denied. It has to be very clear that such conditions cannot be tolerated forever. We live in the 21st century and we are no longer at the Babylonian sex slave market. Prostitution should not be criminalized but a reordering re re is absolutely necessary. This is what a German, a John Rhodes, writes in the AO Horse Forum. AO, I remember, I recall it's um, everything without, so everything without condom, sex without condom, the AO Forum. So here's a chat between two Johns. The one says, in clubs where they only let licensed horse work, you won't be meeting any Ukrainians, not even down the line. That's only possible in the legal gray zone. But for as long as refugees get money from the state, there will be few to none. You got a better chance of hitting one up privately, in which case you'll have to feign romantic interest, etc. And the other says, met one Teresa Orlovsky type while grocery shopping. She has been here for 10 days and has a small kid. Her husband was a soldier and is dead. I've got a chance there. We'll keep at it. So you see the very cynical approach. She is available because she's so very vulnerable. And here, I think it's the last quote I brought for you. As a regal punter, I'm completely conscious of the fact that most prostitutes consume hard drugs, especially while they're working. The dealer has taken the place of the pimp, but they can do with their bodies whatever they want. Anyway, it doesn't bother me. Oh, well, I have one to go, but this is the last one. Pimps are active in the background, in the background all the time. The exceptions where the women are independently working for their own profit can be counted on one hand in every club. If you take an honest look, you'll also find that there are various forms of pimping. It can be her family back home 
whose entire income is dependent on her, who is, put on, who is put under immense psychological pressure to ensure continued income. I am aware of all that, and it's not that I don't care, but that I expect a club owner to keep this in the background so that the, so that the customer is not confronted with this. I can't save the world or get the woman out of their predicament, but I can treat them with respect and I do have empathy for the situation they're in. The only alternative left is a rejection of the system and to stop participating in all of it. This means instead of paying for sex, I take my friends to a thermal bath. Okay, this is the last one, but this is really the last one. Today, the situation is like this. Women from Bulgaria have to finance their living themselves. Ukrainian women get support from authorities since March 2022. So they don't have to do prostitution anymore. You can be mad at me for this, but I can't help myself. Prostitution results from double distress. The man is in need because of the absence of free sex. So he requires pay sex. The woman is in need for money. If good at business, the woman can free herself from this predicament. Not always, not necessarily. But the man will depend on pay sex for his entire life. That should show you which of the two is the weaker one. Many girls make sure to let you feel it too. They rip you off, give bad service, are arrogant. You see, this is also a very recent comment from um, Baden-Württemberg in March 2022. So this John re um, uh, sees himself as a weaker because he's so dependent for life from Paysex. I stop here. Yes, thank you very much, Inge. William, please take the floor. Thanks very much. And uh, I really appreciate the invitation to come and speak with you all today. This is, it sounds like you have uh, participated in several of these webinars, but this is my first and it's great to, to be part of it. Um, it's also a pleasure to talk about this important topic of demand. Um, and indeed, I think as the title of this webinar suggests, uh, the, the, the demand is really about all of us. Uh, and, and confronting demand means removing us and our money from the marketplace that fosters human trafficking. I don't know um, if the people, the audience of this webinar appreciate just how rare and wonderful it is to listen to Brian and Inga talk like that, because as Brian said at the beginning, the the global conversation around trafficking very often does not address demand. And so it's really unusual for me to sit in a, in a webinar and actually hear others uh, discussing a topic that I feel we've been raising over and over again. Uh, about 20 years ago, as Brian said, uh, in 2000, the Palermo Protocol provided us with, with the first international definition of trafficking, and it outlined the three pillars of our response that Brian talked a little bit about, protection, prosecution, and prevention. Uh, but unfortunately, about two decades later, uh, trafficking is worse than ever, Michelle, as you said, opening this conversation and no country has defeated it. In fact, it's increasingly embedded in our economies, our societies, and continues growing, fueled by online platforms, uh, especially in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. This is not to say, however, that I don't think winning the battle against trafficking and exploitation is not possible. I, I absolutely believe it is. But in order to do so, we need to confront the real source of the problem, which has too often remained invisible and outside the scope of states anti-trafficking efforts. So I believe that effectively confronting trafficking today really means addressing its root cause, its true root cause, which is demand. Why? Well, trafficking is for the most part a financially motivated crime. Traffickers exploit their victims to make money. And so, like Brian said earlier, while poverty and injustice might make it easier for traffickers to ensnare victims, that's not what's motivating the crime. What causes it is the $150 billion a year that traffickers can make off exploitation. 
the 150 billion that individuals, businesses, or governments even are knowingly or unknowingly paying for goods or services that are extracted from trafficking victims. Thus, the importance of the demand side interventions is twofold. First, as a means of undermining the financial motivations of the crime, and second, it helps counter the physical and psychological harm suffered by trafficking victims. In fact, if demand is the financial catalyst of traffickers, buyers, by motivating traffickers to traffic, buyers are responsible for the coercion that's inflicted onto trafficking victims. Addressing demand is also the right approach to confront the scale of exploitation in our society. Brian st spoke really eloquently, I think, about how a law enforcement only response is never going to be enough. It's never going to be able to respond to the scale. The size of the problem is such that there just aren't enough police officers to defeat the crime with traditional law enforcement tools. To put it differently, as a trafficking survivor, Rachel Moran, once said, how do you expect to uproot a tree if all you're doing is ripping at the leaves? And I think that captures the challenge before us very well. If we want to eradicate human trafficking, we need to target its roots. So what do I mean by demand and, and how exactly do we go about doing this? Well, first, I think it's necessary to understand that demand manifests slightly differently depending on the form of exploitation, for example, forced labor or sexual exploitation. Trafficking for forced labor, and, and so it's been really nice listening because we had a presentation on forced labor and now a presentation around sexual exploitation. It's really nice to hear those sides, and I'm going to try to bring those together a little bit. Forced labor in, infiltrated into the legal economy to the point that victims are trafficked in sectors that are part of our daily life. Textile manufacturing, construction, food production, whatever. Demand here references the desire to purchase as an intermediate or as an end user goods or services that could be met through forced or exploited labor. Oftentimes, the purchasers won't be aware of the presence of exploitation, but they are still fueling it. And this is one of the great myths about addressing demand that we need to talk about the demand for trafficking. There's very little demand for trafficking. There's demand for goods or services that can be met with trafficking victims. Discouraging the demand that fosters trafficking for forced labor thus requires states to enact laws and regulations that prevent the purchase, either through public procurement or private companies of goods and services produced by or extracted from trafficking victims. When it comes to trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation, the idea is similar, not paying for trafficking. Right? How do we set up policies that make sure that we don't pay for exploitation? Here, demand that fuels trafficking is once again not the demand for trafficking, but rather the demand for paid sex. Men typically, typically do not seek to buy sex from trafficking victims, but rather seek to buy sex and trafficking victims are what they are provided. Once again, as Rachel Moran once said, they don't know and they don't care. Now, I think Inga had some great quotes that suggest some know more than they might like to admit, but in large part, they are willing to buy whatever they can, and oftentimes trafficking victims are what they are given. And this has a clear, clear gender component. We're talking about a demand overwhelmingly created by men whose price is disproportionately paid by women and girls, not only, but disproportionately paid by women and girls. Men who pay for sex from trafficking victims not only are and create the demand, they also form part of the trafficking chain and are inflictors of harm upon victims through engaging in acts akin to rape. And this is really an important point, I think, as, as Inga talked about the phrase sex fires and some of the comments in the chat referred to this as well. I think it's really important to, to note that men who buy sex from trafficking victims are not only fueling exploitation, but engaging in exploitation. This is, by definition, somebody who did not come to this transaction voluntarily, if there is such a thing in this industry. It's somebody who, by definition, came through coercion or force or other means, and therefore, uh, it's non-consensual sex, and it's an exploitative act on its own, and I think this is crucial to, to, take, uh, to take account of. So let me give you two, two concrete examples, one on labor, one on sex. First of all, um, during the pandemic, there was a tremendous demand for medical gloves. Obviously, 
governments needed to respond to this to the pandemic and they needed billions of, gum, of gloves from major companies, major producers around the world, including at least two large companies named Supermax and Top Glove who were using forced labor. Interestingly enough, and this shows the power of demand, uh, indiscriminate demand, if you will, governments in their efforts to respond to a public health problem were inadvertently fueling trafficking and forced labor by buying from companies that were using this forced labor. Whether they knew or not is not entirely the point. The point is that they were buying and they were fueling exploitation in, as a result of it. Likewise, another example is the war and subsequent humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. Since the start of the war, we worked with a technology company to follow online traffic and we discovered that global online searches for explicit content and sexual services from Ukrainian women and girls have increased dramatically. Staggeringly, they, uh, global searches for Ukrainian pornography grew by 600%, searches for Ukrainian escorts by 200%. This was across multiple countries and multiple languages. This data illuminates a spiking demand for sexual access to Ukrainian women and girls, a demand that is quite frankly not at all concerned about vulnerability as Inga's quotes just showed. Inga, I prosecuted a man uh, several years ago who said to his friends, and I'm going to use a quote as you did, war is great for the sex trade. That, that was how he viewed the tremendous vulnerability that results from conflict. And we might view the conflict as a great tragedy, but he viewed it as an opportunity. And I think that's entirely consistent with the quotes you shared with us earlier. Once again, I remind you of Rachel Moran's quote, they don't know and they don't care. This once again shows that crises provide fertile ground for human trafficking, making our work especially urgent. So let me describe a little bit about what the OSC is trying to do to address this. In combating the demand that fosters trafficking for forced labor, we are supporting states in adopting policies and laws that establish pro protective measures, foster transparency and due diligence in supply chains, those are a lot of complicated words. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that we need laws and policies that states can require companies to make sure that they are not buying goods and services from trafficking victims, right? It's just that simple. If, if we want to stop trafficking, we got to stop paying for it. And so we produce model guidelines, a model law, and a compendium of resources for states to actually adopt those provisions. We're now working on spreading those uh, materials and raising awareness about how to implement them and what the options are for countries through workshops across various countries in the OSC region. Uh, it's actually quite surprising how new these concepts are for so many countries. They sound reasonable, they sound obvious, yet as Brian said, the last 20 years of anti-trafficking work has not emphasized this approach. We're also working inside the OSC ourselves. We, we really believe we need to lead by example on this. International organizations are fantastic at pointing the finger at countries to do more, but not so good at doing their own work. And so what we decided to do was try to, to address that ourselves. We uh, led the way by adopting measures internally on our own procurement processes to make sure that we're not buying um, goods and services from trafficking victims. And now we're supporting other international organizations in doing the same including through the UN by co-chairing a task force with ILO on how to make sure that the UN can adopt these same principles. Uh, parallel to this work on trafficking for labor uh, exploitation, we're doing a lot on the, the topic of trafficking for sexual exploitation. Last year, we produced a groundbreaking paper on discouraging the demand that fosters trafficking for pur purposes of sexual exploitation. And the paper provided the most comprehensive overview of states' international obligations to discourage demand that fosters uh, sexual exploitation and offers recommendations to countries. Stunningly, stunningly, in 2000, the Palermo Protocol established a legal obligation for all countries to address demand, all forms of demand, and it's mandatory. And in those 20 years, nobody has produced a comprehensive paper on how to discourage the demand that fosters trafficking for sexual exploitation. This is really quite amazing. 
So we wrote the paper and we've now shared it with you all. And it's really important for countries to start doing this. If any country, and there's 185 of them that signed up to the Palermo Protocol, if any country signed that convention, they're obligated to start working on demand. So it's time to get started. As mentioned before, trafficking for sexual exploitation is increasingly an online phenomenon. And it's impossible to have a discussion about trafficking today without factoring in the role of technology. So we also produced a policy paper outlining how laws and policies can try to prevent technology facilitated trafficking. Again, this is a huge topic right now in the European Union as they try to figure out how to make the online environment more safe. And all of those websites that Inga was talking about earlier, the, the hobby boards, the John boards, the sexual service websites, none of them have prevention measures in place to make sure that they're not selling children, that they're not selling exploited adults. There is nothing. They claim to have moderators. They don't. We know this because we've worked um, on numerous cases involving these sites over and over again. Children and exploited people are found on those sites. What we'd like to do is make sure now that states have the policy options in front of them and can adopt the laws that they need. Finally, last year, we held our flagship conference called the Alliance Conference on the topic of demand. The first such conference, in my, to my knowledge, at the, by, held by an international organization entirely devoted to the topic of addressing demand. And we put um, the, the report from that conference also in the chat so you can take a look at it. So this is where we are at right now. And what we are trying to do is where do we go from here? Try to figure out what to do next. Well, first of all, I think we really need states to implement their, their international legal obligations. This needs attention. And they have a bunch of resources they can take from the papers that we've produced and, and other papers as well. There's been a lot of action on preventing trafficking for forced labor by addressing the demand side. There's been almost none comparatively on the sexual exploitation side. Some countries are adopting the equality model, which is a, is a positive trend, but others are, are doing absolutely nothing. In our study of uh, discouraging demand, we identified that of the 57 OSCE countries, 20 had zero, zero identifiable initiatives at all on addressing the demand that fosters trafficking for sexual exploitation. That means they are not meeting their international legal obligations. Which brings me to my final point. The major challenge right now remains the need for political will to address these problems. Granting the necessary resources for all government intervention, but also making sure that we fund all of the other programs that need attention, protection and assistance for victims and, and so forth. But it also means investing in prevention, commensurate to the scale of the, of the problem and in policy reform. So it's time for states to move beyond general awareness campaigns and really start to invest in deterrence and disruption in early childhood education. Why are we teaching so many girls to not get trafficked, but we're not teaching boys to stop exploiting girls? This is amazing to me that, that we are still in this position now. There needs to be a serious attention in schools on gender equality, on consent, on, um, on behaviors that the underlying behaviors that are part of those quotes that Inga read to you earlier. Let me conclude with this. The, the current situation is challenging and human trafficking is increasingly intertwined with the fabric of our societies and our economies. But I also see a new attention, a new willingness to address this topic of demand. The fact that this webinar itself is on demand tells you something, right? The conversation is increasing and more and more we're turning on how to address the root causes. So if, if, if we want to move from the topic of combating human trafficking to actually ending it, the time is now to start talking about addressing demand in a really holistic and comprehensive way. So thanks so much for the opportunity again to join you all today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabian, for uh, your very clear uh, explanations. And uh, I think uh, uh, indeed, you, you, you have an assistant who is uh, uh, giving us the references of many uh, interesting OSCE um, uh, reports uh, and definitely we'll keep them also in, uh, in the handouts. Uh, now, I wanted to ask uh, Brian, Brian, can you take over as, uh, as moderator and uh, uh, possibly ask uh, Inge uh, to, to finish 
uh, speech because I'm sorry, I did not want to interrupt you, but uh, 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 I was thinking that uh, uh, we needed to, to, to hear the three of you, uh, and now we, we have uh, uh, clearly uh, a quite interesting uh, figure, picture of, uh, of uh, what, uh, uh, what demand is, demand for uh, uh, prostitution, demand for forced labor, and, and what we could possibly try to do. Uh, and uh, so, Brian, please. I think there are a lot of questions in the sidebar for Inge in particular, in particular, uh, because we're, I mean, although I like to talk about the issue of uh, the demand for sexual exploitation as well, you're, you're in the hot seat tonight on this one. So, uh, one of the questions that has come up is asked by, uh, let me see, uh, Agnes, uh, who has asked, uh, a long thing, but in there, there's, there's an interesting question, of course. Why there are human rights organizations like Amnesty International doing campaigns to repeal laws that are punishing brothel owners, pimps, and clients? Why are the organizations like Amnesty International wanting that women are sexually exploited? Do you expect an answer from me? Is this a, a question um, asked? Uh, so they asked me. Well, uh, I cannot. I, I, I'm just wondering about the the approach of um, Amnesty International. It's probably as well you, uh, Brian, or uh, maybe also um, Valiant you. So um, I I can't I can't explain it. So I, I, well, but uh, most probably it's it's the case like it was also in Germany. They just wanted to 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 get away from this. Um, criminalizing prostitution yeah? so prostitute decriminalizing prostitution and uh, looking for results from this so it's a new approach decriminalizing prostitution i say this is or we say in germany telefarm and uh, like more than 40 other institutions in germany say no this was the wrong way but political decisions and also um, humanitarian de decisions take time and so they came to that conclusion i don't want to defend that I'm wondering about that. So no explanation from my side to that topic. <laughs> That's an absurd uh, decision. Our uh, approach is abolish it, abolish prostitution, but help the women and girls in prostitution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to me, the Amnesty International position actually goes back to the drafting of the trafficking protocol, where there was this schism. And the schism was between liberal feminism and radical feminism. Radical feminism has resulted in the equalities model or the Nordic model. Liberal feminism has resulted in Amnesty International's approach. Uh, this is, and this school of feminism, their approach is, uh, principally that, uh, women are free to choose to be in prostitution and to sell their bodies, right? So that's the liberal feminist school. Otherwise, it's also called the, the lipstick feminist school for various reasons. But Amnesty kind of sided, seems to have sided with one, uh, of those sides in the schism leading up to the protocol. And Valiant, you have a, a comment on this question as well. It, so this is just an open discussion, by the way, so you don't need to raise your hand, just jump in and shoot. As a newbie, I wanted to enter softly there. So thank you. Um, I, I, you know, Brian, I, I suppose that, that part of it could be a, an analysis around feminism and, and um, uh, as you articulated, but I, I think some of the organizations that have come out in support of, of decriminalization have argued that in some countries where the selling of sex is criminalized, the women are often extorted, blackmailed, raped by law enforcement and others and are not in a position where they can come forward because they're arrested much greater rates than, than uh, the buyers are. And to some extent, this is true. The problem is, is that the solution to the harms of prostitution is not more prostitution. And what happens through the approach that they're advocating to decriminalize all aspects of it is that it does only the problem of expanding the market and encouraging and condoning and setting a social norm for more buying. And the problem is, is there is not an endless supply of women, even if we assume that there are women who want to do this, there is not an endless supply of them, but there are, there is a very large demand. And so how do you meet that demand? You meet it through exploitation. 
And so the, I think that, that the policies that are being proposed by some of these organizations are intended to try to help women, but are misguided in that they actually expand the problem and make it worse. And here's where I'll respond to another question that was asked, which is, does the equality model work? Well, in several countries where it has been adopted, the trafficking rates by many estimates are lower than in countries where there is full decriminalization. And in fact, in countries where decriminal buying is decriminalized, then the rates are higher, but also the rates of violence are lower. Um, in, in similar periods of time, Sweden had one, possibly, it was questionable, one homicide in the prostitution industry, whereas Germany had well over 100. Now, of course, they're different sizes of country, but that doesn't account for the difference in the violence. In Canada, which recently adopted the uh, equality model a few years ago, they saw a, an immediate 12% reduction in violence reported by people in prostitution and a 35% reduction in homicides. So again, the, the point is that I think that some of those organizations are trying to look at a very short-term problem of alleviating the harassment and the exploitation of women in criminalized systems with corrupt police, and they're trying to solve that with a policy that doesn't make any sense at all. Maybe just uh, may I add something uh, to that? Um, I, I just uh, when we when we have just once again a look at the Swedish model. So when they started like 20 years ago, um, so the, the evaluation of the Swedish um, act sh showed clearly that the number of um, people on the street pros prostitution ha has been halved since 1999, um, while in other countries like Denmark uh, it has tripled in the same time. And there is no evidence that more Swedes are going abroad to buy sex, interestingly enough. Uh, so um, because the, the value system has changed there in, in Sweden. And yeah. of course, prostitution has uh, via Internet has increased in Sweden, as in other countries as well, due to the technolog technological developments and Internet, of course. Yeah. Um, but when you see the number of... Uh, of uh, websites and advertising, uh, it is much higher, as you pointed out, Valiant, uh, in um, Denmark or Germany or in other countries. So, um, in uh, countries where prostitution is legalized. So, um, the number of people in prostitution from third countries, from migrant countries, has not increased as much as in neighboring countries of uh, Sweden. And there has also been no expansion of hidden prostitution because uh, the social institutions in, in Sweden and also the police always emphasize that prostitution can cannot be completely hidden or so because it uh, relies on advertising to reach the, the joints. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there are clear effects of the Nordish model. Yeah. Positive it, effects. It's, it's really important, Inga, that point you made about the change in value that comes from it. So the, the, it, there, was a very, there was a sea change in Swedish society when this law was brought out. I mean... Things were already starting to shift on violence against women in Sweden. Uh, it was, you know, younger and younger ages of schools were being taught, in particular boys were being taught about violence against, violence against girls and violence against women. And it became very, very much a part of the culture as this law came into being that violence against women included all of these different behaviors. Uh, and as a Swedish man, I can tell you things have really changed in the last 20 years. It is so outside the culturally accepted precepts of Swedish society amongst men that they can not just buy women, but they don't even ogle women, right? They don't objectify women. They don't, they're very careful about how they talk about women and the way women dress and things like this. And it's so unbelievably a, a social outcast to become a social outcast to talk about these things in any terms other than other than that they're, they're, they're dreadful and, and should be subject to opprobrium. And so that's, re that's been reflected, of course, in the statistics around violence against women, the, uh, which, if you look at them in Sweden, there's been a massive uptick in violence against women in Sweden, if you look at the statistics. But in fact, it's because women and men have become more empowered to report violence against women. So there's been a huge uptick, uptick in reports of violence against women, largely attributed to this, I think, this empowerment. Um, yeah, okay.
uh, I can talk forever. But, uh, there was a question here, uh, and Valiant, maybe you want to start with this one. There's this uh, question about the equality model. Uh, how could it be improved? Is there Are there additional laws or measures that could be applied to make the equalities model even more successful? Well, one of the things that uh, we have seen in um, in all countries, including those that have adopted the equality model and those that have not, is inadequate attention to the online aspects of it. And here um, you need a different set of laws that relate to the websites where these things are happening. These websites exist in every country, regardless of their legalization of prostitution or not. In the US, for example, Prostitution, selling and buying is criminalized almost everywhere, and there are thousands of websites. Um, and, and that it, it's like that in many places. So the reason I'm emphasizing this is that it is important to address the sort of social norms of these things, uh, to address harmful conduct, to address behavior that is um, uh, it, it rises to the level of criminal activity or sexual violence. But it's also important to to address and to dismantle the infrastructure that is facilitating all of this. And the online uh, platforms, the sexual service websites, the pornography um, platforms that uh, where where people are trafficked for forced pornography or um, other locations need to be dismantled or prevention measures need to be applied to make sure that these platforms are not uh, facilitating and making this whole exploitative industry much more efficient. Um, it's like operating a bookstore versus operating Amazon, right? The difference between the speed and efficiency and scale of the online market is so tremendous that if you don't dismantle that infrastructure, you're going to have a very, very hard time combating it. And so I think there's a number of things I could say in this, but that would be the number one thing that I think uh, needs to go alongside of the policies around buying and selling of sex or around traffickers and, and how they should be punished. So, um, uh, Inga, uh, what, what's your response to, the, to that question about what can we do more to, uh, to improve on the equalities model? Well, first of all, I like the, the, the term now, equality model. Um, we have in Germany, we uh, spoke a lot about the Nordic model. Yeah, now equality model, wonderful. But what we try to establish now is in order to put some more pressure on the politicians is um, that we speak about the new German way. <laughs> Sometimes you have to sell terminology to people because politician, politicians don't want to adopt such things like Nordic uh, role models or so. Yeah. Yeah? So they want to, ha they, to have their own way, the special German way. So now the new German way is um, our new term terminology for the equality model, let's say. Well, actually, there is no, um, there's no other way than this equality model. And I want to, I want to uh, just um, remember that also in 1994, 1949, you the United Nations declared, um, well, as early as 1949, that prostitution and the evil of uh, trafficking, which accompanies it, which accompanies prostitution, are incompatible with the dignity and worth of the human person. And according to the UN, this also applies to so-called voluntary prostitution. Yeah. So, and then in 2013-14, we know the European Parliament declared on prostitution that with it, human dignity would be despised and that it was incompatible with gender equality. Yeah? But um, this has apparently left little traces in our country. So, but uh, let me add just a little bit satirical that Germany always needs several calls to finally catch up with EU laws um, as soon as it comes to equal rights for women. Yeah. But after eight years after this declaration of the European Union, it's high time in Germany that German politicians take care of this scandal. Yeah. So um, how to implement it? I mean, why don't we start with what we learned from other countries and put it into a special German way? I mean, we see now that in Germany there are so many uh, hundreds and thousands of migrant women 
and it's it's not the fault and the responsibility of the women to to help themselves out. So the part of this Nordic model or the G new German way is of course helping them with real helping and supporting programs and not just cosmetics. So when we see at our consultation centers or the shelter centers, the humanitarian aid organizations like Solvudi, they are they are bitterly under uh, under finance. So we don't have the money. We are we depend on donations. But this is a already known problem. So um, one of the things to do is uh, really get the money from the from from the perpetrators, from the pimps and the traffickers and put them into in the, into social service in order to support the women. But we don't want to uh, see now the, uh, the, the, uh, the victim side. And then please do what we already have in our laws, because since a few years we have, in, at least in the human trafficking law, we do have already the ban of the Johns. A John or sex buyer who buys the services of a trafficked woman is punishable. But up to now, we do not have one single case <laughs> in our uh, uh, in the, of punishment. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have the law, but we do not have the punishment. So this is but this is true only for human trafficking. Then you know that human trafficking is always very hard to um, to prove. Yeah. So why don't we just put the same um, law into into anti pimping? We we have an anti pimping law and the anti trafficking law. Why don't we just apply this? Yeah? This would be a challenge for the new um, for the new government. Unfortunately, our new government in Germany is not prone to to do so. They just um, it's, it's, it's the Greens and the Social Democrats and the Liberals, and they are not having on their plan anything with the prostitution laws. But it is obvious and that they know um, that the prostitution law from 2017, which was a, a little amendment. Is already has also failed because this is uh, obvious. So this is my part. Uh, why don't we just uh, switch the law which we have already the uh, the banning of the Johns in the anti-trafficking law into our regular law? There's another question that uh, both of you might like to have a say on. I'll let you fight it out. Who goes first? But it's this nexus between uh, pornography and. Uh, prostitution and violence against women, uh, pornography teaching boys to be violent against women. Can I, can both of you maybe want to have a go at that, or Inga first? Yes, uh, I read that and thank you very much for this question or for this comment, because I mentioned before that Spain is preparing now a law uh, according to the Nordic model or the equality model. And what do they also tackle with that? Pornography. Because what we always say are also the, the former prostitutes, the, the, the former victims of lover boys of, or of human trafficking here in German, Germany, these wonderful women like Huske Mao or Sandra Novak, they always say pornography is the theory, prostitution is the praxis, the practical um, yeah. applied. So whatever the John see in pornography, they come to the brothers and then they, uh, they then they uh, want it from the from the women and girls and the brothers of street prostitution. Mm -hmm. So whatever new practice they see there, they want to have applied have it applied on th themselves in the brothers. And then they see that in the brothers of street prostitution it is possible. And then they go home and they want the same the same from their hus uh, from their wives or their fiancés or their uh, girlfriends. So pornography is a theory um, and. The prostitution is the the, the pra practice, mm. and what the Sweden Swedish also do. Uh, I remember from Per Anders Sunnesson, he told us last year or the year before that, well, the Swedish started with prostitution and now they are going to tackle pornography. Yeah. So this uh, this intersection, pornography theory and prostitution of practice is is just true. We have to tackle that as well and to educate boys that it's not okay to use pornography because this is just a theory. And on the other side, they are suffering women, also suffering women in pornography, of course, because what they sell to you as a voluntary work in pornography. I, when I used to be an investigative journalist like 15, 20 years ago, I reported also on pornography and the sex trade, which takes place in pornography with these actresses, actresses yeah, and uh, the pimps behind them. So um, yes, that's from my side for the moment. Valley, would you have a, com a, com a, uh, a comment on perhaps at the institutional level what we could be doing about this to tackle this obvious connection between these two things? 
Uh, well, first of all, I'll, I'll say that a lot of uh, what Inga is, is said has is, is been my experience as well. I, I think that uh, when we talk to survivors, they often talk about um, not only uh, being raped, but having it filmed. And then uh, that's shared and perpetuated, which for many of them creates a compounding harm over time because th those those videos get uploaded online and then the, it's it's the trauma of knowing that it's out there, right? Um, on the other hand, as Inga said, uh, we've also, when I was a prosecutor, we, we um, heard from many men that they had uh, started with pornography and then moved to actually acting on it. And, um, and over time, their interests got more in younger girls and younger and younger. And, um, and, and so it, it did certainly seem, it's hard for me to articulate it as a cause and effect, but it was certainly a very disturbing correlation. And so, uh, that, that's, that's really problematic. At an institutional level, it's difficult because pornography in many countries is protected speech. Um, but what I think is not been appreciated in those analyses is the extent to which it is um, exploitative or violent or um, criminal. And uh, free speech does not protect criminal activity. And so what uh, needs to be put into place are better protections, I think, for, at the policy level on how that happens, including, as I said before, what is uploaded, what is shown on, on video sites, um, to better um, restrict the exploitative nature of this. Let me give you a very quick example. A lot of uh, countries are exploring age verification technology right now to try to prevent children from watching, viewing pornography on websites. This is a, a worthy goal and something that should be um, that should be considered so that we aren't building another generation of people demanding you know, violent acts from, from, from their, their partners or from people in prostitution. But oftentimes what is not happening in those policy discussions is age verification of the people depicted in pornography. So there is no protection that the people being shown are not minors, for example. They're, they're, they're t putting into place policies to make sure that children aren't watching it but they're not making policies put in place to make sure children aren't in it. And that is a real problem in policy responses and needs to be fixed. I know that I've spoken a lot about tech, but I, I cannot overemphasize the extent to which technology has exploded this problem uh, to, to a scale that is very hard to imagine. Um, I'm gonna need to go in a second. So if I could take one quick sentence and respond to this question from Janet Palafox about how consumers can make informed decisions. And Brian, I bet you have some things to say on this as well. Um, there are a lot of websites out there that can help inform consumers about uh, whether the items they're buying were produced with slave labor. Um, and I'm sure Brian can elaborate on those. But I wanted to highlight this because it emphasizes the difference between trafficking for labor exploitation and trafficking for sexual exploitation. Trafficking for sexual exploitation, the victim and the end user are in close and intimate and direct contact with each other, which highlights the need for um, intervention with that end user, either deterrence or criminal action or whatever. With labor exploitation, I could be six or 10 or 100 steps removed from the child that made my shoes, for example. And so it's much more difficult for end users to know uh, specific information about that. Not impossible, as I'm sure Brian will explain in a minute. But what that highlights is that our policy interventions need to take place at a whole bunch of points along the way between the end user and the victim. And this means in the first supplier, the second sub supplier, the third, th and, and down through the, the supply chain to make sure that we have protections all the way through so that at no point uh, exploited goods and services get in there. That's not a super satisfying answer for those who are wanting to not buy goods made with exploited labor, but there are also some other options there. 
I just wanted to add that in because I because I have to leave uh, the conversation. But thanks everybody so much for and and Michelle, thanks for raising this really crucial topic. I I, I so appreciate it. Thanks also to Brian and Inga. It was great to listen to you both. Thanks, Brian. Likewise, good to see you. I would say I'm very grateful to to Val for being with us, but uh, I'm also extremely grateful to both of you, Inge uh, and uh, Brian. Okay. Um, Inge, do you mind if I jump in on this? Is this okay? I don't want to sideline you. It's okay? Okay, good. Um, so one of, one of the things that has not happened yet in global value chains is that we don't understand it's not been internalized to realize that in workplaces, human rights exist on a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum is all of these conditions we're talking about with modern slavery. We're talking about human trafficking, forced labor, child labor, and the old style of slavery and servitude. These exist on a spectrum. And so, as with all spectrums, there's another end to it. And if we don't reconceptualize this, uh, or if we do reconceptualize this as being this human rights spectrum in workplaces, one of the really great advantages is that we can forget for now all of these legal definitions and the arguments that go on about these legal definitions. <coughs> Thanks to this exploitation creep that I mentioned earlier, if you don't any longer need to be able to legally distinguish between forced labor and human trafficking, for example, it makes little to no difference to the victim, after all. My first child labor case was a child labor, forced labor, human trafficking, and slavery and servitude case. 12-year-old boy fitted all four definitions, and he still wasn't helped. It didn't matter at all that we sit here and academics argue and, and politicians argue about these distinctions between these, these legal forms. So that murky pool of exploitation at the bottom end is characterized by low respect for human rights. One or two rights extremely eroded or lots could be eroded. In any case, we know that life down that end of the pool is pretty bad. At the far right of the spectrum is that rather heavenly place we might call decent work. If we could tell that someone is in conditions close to the decent work end of the spectrum, closer than the modern slavery end of the spectrum, you can see quite quickly what we've done. We've proved a culture of respect for human rights in a workplace. In so doing, we have actually disproved that modern slavery exists. Because decent work and modern slavery can't coexist in the same workplace. You can't be at both ends of the same spectrum at the same time. These are not isolated cases. Human rights uh, issues in workplaces like modern slavery are never isolated incidents. So if we identify the culture in a workplace, we've identified the issue and we can weed out a culture that, that speaks to labor problems. So so when I started uh, when I started my NGO Slave Free Trade, it really started from that perspective that we could operationalize international human rights law. We could create a model that was agnostic to country, to jurisdiction, to legal definitions, and and really just look at that uh, locating a workplace on this spectrum of human rights. Uh, and then, of course, the next question was how do how do you how do you locate that workplace? So with uh, the the way Slave Free Trade we do it, we have. Uh, what we call core processes, four core processes. And the first one is um, a lesson I learned from that child labor case was that the legal definitions didn't mean anything to him. International law and the framing of it didn't mean anything to him. What really mattered was somebody understanding what his lived life was like in the workplace. And so we have a process we call workforce assessment, which is the first process. This is a process that garners the individual view of people in workplaces about their conditions. Because as you think about your workplace, you're the best judge of your conditions. Your employer is not. So workforce assessment. The second process is called policy alignment. So this is where the company gets to have its say. Does it have a policy on this? Does it have a grievance resolution mechanism? What is it? What training does it provide on this, this, and this? This is the corporate view. And the corporate view, just to say, that is what you get in almost every existing scheme. Fair trade, B Corp, Global Reporting Initiative, Dow Jones questionnaire on, uh, on, on sustainability. So all the sustainability ratings agencies, they are all based on the company's assessment of their own conditions. Self-assessment, self-reporting. I think you can quite quickly see what the problem with that model is. The third service, the third process that all companies have to go through when they join slave free trade is called impact communications, where alongside the workforce questions, 
we've integrated impact related questions. So we're trying to understand what impact this is having. Is it improving trust in the workplace? Has employer employee relations changed, et cetera? And the impact on the community. Every workplace is a complex adaptive system inside a complex adaptive system, a community around them. And we need to make sure it's net positive impact that we're having. And the fourth one, and this speaks to the global value chains, the fourth process is it's a little bit slave free trade secret source. We call it network mapping. And it actually goes back to one of my a very common counter narcotics investigative technique, which if you want to get to a human a drug trafficker, for example, you start with it. You don't go straight to try to find the drug trafficker or the importer. You start with a user and find the dealer. You start with you go to that dealer and find the next level dealer. So what you do is you peel it off a layer at a time because each of those entities only knows the next one in the chain. It's exactly the same in global value chains. Uh, a, a chocolatier in the UK knows its cocoa processor because that's who they buy their cocoa from. The chocolatier in the UK doesn't know the cocoa plantation where the beads come from. So there's something we have to break down there. And the way we do it is this simple investigative technique. One layer at a time, we peel it off. And at the same time, we have to recognize there is a reason there is this blindness in global value chains, why company A can't see what company C is doing. Because the communication between workplaces in global value chains, between companies in global value chains, is a two-track conversation, price and quality. They don't care about the conditions in the workplace from the company they're buying from. And even if they could care about it, they're just going to get the company self-reporting and saying, nah, everything's good. Then at the at the next level, because of commercial secrecy, businesses won't tell their clients who their supplier is in turn. So company A can't find out who company C is, and they certainly can't find out the conditions. So in the process that we've developed, the network mapping process, we keep the commercial secrecy blinkers up. So company A still can't see the, 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 the identity and location of the plantation, not the precise location. But what they can see, we reduce, we take the blinkers off for the conditions in the workplace. So we're communicating through the entire value chain, the conditions in each workplace, but maintaining the commercial secrecy. And so the interesting effect that's had, we've done this, uh, we've already done a cocoa supply chain. So the effect that it's had is that the workplaces in that chain become dependent on the human rights performance of others in the chain because the chocolate bar can't go on the shelf unless the cocoa processor and the cocoa plantation are all human rights and, and the chocolatier are all human rights compliant. So they start to depend on it. So going back to that earlier point that I made about ROI, businesses are always saying, what's the return on investment? Well, the return on investment is quite simply that chocolate bar gains 45% year on year sales growth by virtue of being sl proven slave free and everybody in the chain benefits from that 45% year on year sales growth. So the ROI is that the bottom line becomes dependent on the human rights performance of all of the companies in the chain and they start talking about human rights in a way they never have before. So this is the kind of sea change we're looking at and, and the way consumers and I use a broad term for consumers, consumers, public procurement agencies, investors, anybody who can make a buying decision that can influence purchasing is a consumer in this model. So a public procurement agency that gets five, ten, a ministry of defense that gets five tenders across their table for army boots, 80% likely to have slavery behind those boots. What would a public procurement agency do if one of those companies could suddenly prove that their boots are slave-free or human rights compliant? The public procurement agency, the category manager at the public procurement agency at the Ministry of Defense, they have no choice but to take the slave free. Because if they don't take the slave free, it's their ass. Right? In in twelve months' time, when Parliament asks the question about why they took another one, a human rights one that couldn't prove human rights compliance, it's their ass. The public procurement agency needs to do it. And in places like the UK now, public procurement, they're required to include social sustainability and human rights in their evaluation. It's ten percent of the evaluation for public bodies in the UK for the evaluation. So there are all sorts of triggers we can pull and and what we're doing at Slave Free Trade is, uh, and you'll see this in August with the first, the world's first guaranteed slave free choc cocoa chocolate bars on the shelves in the UK. Uh, what we're doing is we're putting a our logo on products where the, where the entire value Ooh. chain is human rights compliant. Um, and so this means that the consumer standing in front of the, 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 the chocolate bars in the supermarket 
can actively make a choice. And I can tell you that when you put these products on the shelves and you put one slave-free label on one of the chocolates, people jump on it. It's mm. It may not be 100% conversion, but it's really close to it. It's a compelling proposition for a consumer. In the same way, the public procurement agent can't make a different, can't, can't buy against the idea of human rights compliance. It's the same with the shopper. There's a strong emotional resonance, which means they suddenly seeing slave free on a product. The consumer starts to feel like the hero in the story. Yeah. They start to, they start to get power from the simple act of purchasing. And that micro behavior is what we're trying to trigger and then scale it. So that micro behavior multiplied millions of times. That's global social change right there. Mm -hmm. So this is what we can do about labor, mm -hmm. labor exploitation in supply chains, global value chains. Oh, thank you very much. Well, it, it, it's very good that you, uh, you finish with this very concrete example, which could be obviously imitated in many other countries. And uh, this slave free label is, is powerful and is a good motivation for, for many people. Uh, now, uh, Inge, would you like also to, to have a concluding statement and possibly a concrete proposal, so to say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, as you know, I'm uh, speaking about the sexual exploitation, the trafficking for sexual exploitation. And um, I, I would really stress in my last words only those two things. Um, as I mentioned, the new German way, but uh, which is based on the Nordic model, on the equality, equality model, I have still two, uh, two points to mention. So when we really want to reduce demand, then we also have to look at preventing entry into prostitution so uh, and entry uh, entering prostitution also takes place uh, for example in germany by so called entry counseling so entering into prostitution counseling which is also provided by ngos yeah we have a lot of ngos here in germany which are not helping women coming out of prostitution but they are counseling them in they uh, and a lot of of, of uh, our um, former uh, prostitutes or, or women who were in prostitution and girls said, well, they wanted to exit prostitution and they turned to a NGO, which they thought which would come and do street work and they turned to them and they said to the, to, to that woman, uh, for example, well, uh, maybe you don't know how to do properly prostitution. Maybe you should better know how to protect yourself, how to say no or how to 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 do it professionally i mean that that that's what they were told so they wanted to exit this horror they were uh, run down they were really uh, was uh, traumatized and and then they are being told that they are doing not properly or not professionally so this entry counseling has to stop yeah um and of course how can we reduce demand it's by Closing brothers, yeah. So, um, we re reduce the current oversupply, uh, oversupply of women and girls from migrant countries by closing brothers and, of course, penalizing clients, as I said, yeah, Johns, and stop also this entry counseling. And then make sure, this is my second point, that you have really consistent prosecution, a clear legal framework with practical instruments and clear options for action, um, for consistent and effective prosecution for all profiteers in prostitution, pimps, human traffickers, landlords of prostitution premises, clubs and so on, operators of advertising platforms, and of course, um, f uh, forums for, for the johns. Huh? So, and clients and penalizing clients. So, this is a very effective and um, yeah, a good approach to to uh, to to do it on a practical level. Yeah, consistent persecution and preventing entry entering into prostitution and reducing demand. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and just to cap off, if I may, Michelle, with just one very quick statement to 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 talk about the power of the demand side. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, I've worked with the trafficking law enforcement authorities around the world, and one of the one of my colleagues in Sweden worked on a. Uh, on a case uh, with a, a and there was a listening device um, material on a, a known trafficker who was telling his people to wrap up the operation and move to Denmark because his his uh, market his market had dried up. Hmm. 
if you don't, if you need, if you need evidence of the demand side, the equalities model working, there it is right there. <laughs> Thank you, Brian, for this very concrete example. No, no, I think we had a, a very good webinar, and thanks to the, the three of you and, uh, and Inge, uh, Brian, and of course, Valiant. Um, and I must say, you know, next webinar uh, will be precisely on justice and human trafficking, the gap between the law and its implementation in practice. So it will be on the 20th of uh, June, a Tuesday at the same hour, and with three experts, one we all know, Kevin Highland, uh, the second, Fausto Poca, is a, a very good uh, human rights, international human law, and international criminal law lawyer, expert, and Anna Werner, who is a, uh, also um, an attorney at law in Geneva, and, uh, and, and I think with those three, it will not be it will not be theory, but really practice. You know? mm -hmm. So that's why uh, I really think it would be well worth uh, for all of us uh, to be back uh, on the 20th uh, on, on, on this webinar. And uh, I, I would like to, uh, of course, thank all speakers and participants. We had participants, at least I, I could see messages, you know, from Indonesia, uh, Brazil, Canada, Lebanon, Switzerland, of course, Tunisia, uh, uh, the US, uh, New York, Rwanda, Finland, Morocco, and uh, I, I'm sure I'm forgetting many. But uh, thank you for, for being with us, for all of you. And thank you also for sharing those webinars, because as you know, we shall uh, video record them, subtitle them in seven languages, and then you can freely uh, share them. Uh, also, I would like to uh, thank uh, Yves Reichenbach and Clara Isepi. Uh, uh, both of them uh, have uh, uh, contributed to the organization of this webinar. And uh, uh, so my invitation, come back on the 20th. Uh, uh, you are very welcome. And uh, again, many thanks uh, to all of you, uh, and especially Inge for uh, braving the uh, uh, the traffic in Leipzig uh, and uh, Brian, uh, we are very happy to see you all, all with you. We hope to see you again uh, uh, in person. Uh, and my best wishes to your daughter because uh, uh, I know that uh, she is a very happy girl. Yes. <laughs> very good. <laughs> so, thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Oh, great to see you again. Take uh, care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye.